welcome viewers. We are in an interaction, an inclusive interaction with one of the most prominent journalists and TV news anchor who has now become an author and delved into the intricacies of Indian politics and the ideologies that are surrounding and dominating the political paradigm of India. In his book, Modi and India 2024 and the battle for Bharat. Now we, ha we have with us Rahul Shiv Shankar, the man who doesn't shy away from being upfront and presenting the hard facts. Hello Rahul, welcome to this interaction. It's a privilege to be speaking with you. Absolute privilege to be speaking Thank to you. you. Now to begin with, in the current political uh, scenario, uh, how have you been able to, when, especially when the polar, polarization is rampant, how have you been able to navigate through the challenges of presenting an unbiased or a balanced perspective or a narrative, especially when you were dealing with topics as nuanced as, uh, you know, Hindi Rashtra or like you've given, uh, you know, a study of inclusivity in your book? Well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and giving me the space really to explain uh, what this book is about. The context of this book is the elections. So the election that is going to take place in 2024 in just about five and a half months is thought to be a watershed election. Well, why is it a watershed election? Because many people think that after this, you know, it's the 77th year of uh, India becoming a republic and the Prime Minister in the 75th year had decided to pivot India towards what was known as its uh, Indic past. Now, many people felt that that was a pivot towards an exclusivist idea of India, mm -hmm. a Hindu Rashtra, where minorities would not perhaps have equal rights to the majority. And if you look at the narrative that is being put out by the opposition and a large number of those who support the opposition in this country, and I don't generally like to label people, but let's say that you know, the people who are so, so supposedly on the left and call themselves secular. Now, what do they say? They say that, look, uh, at the end of the day, we are becoming a Hindu Pakistan, and this is a watershed election, and this is our last opportunity to stop the birth of this second republic, which will be very different from the idea of India as it was expounded in 1947. So you could call it the Nehruvian idea of India. Now, the fact is that while there are a lot of polarizing opinions that come out of also the BJP's ecosystem. One has to be able to distinguish very cleanly between the normal political expression of the Bharatiya Janata Party and the larger civilizational impulses that actually inform its ideological outlook. So you have to draw that distinction. Now, this civilizational outlook is derived from a very Indic impulse. And what is the real basis of our Indic civilization? It is Sanatana Dharma. And Sanatana Dharma, by its very, very uh, originating precept, is an inclusive and very secular outlook. It doesn't militate against anyone. So fundamentally, if a country evolves into a Dharmic Rashtra, it will pose no problems to anyone in humanity, including our minorities. So I think that was very important because there is a certain colonial, you know, a narrative that was set in colonial times to divorce our Hindu roots from our larger sort of national imagination. And it has been to the detriment, really, of our country's evolution. Right. Uh, while we are talking about fundamentalism uh, being one major source of driving or, evo uh, or ev helping in the evolution of this new republic that you've said, your book is also largely emphasizing on dharma as the foundation for a new republic, uh, which has also garnered a lot of praise in the foreword that has come in the book. But on the other hand, critis critics have contended that it might undermine India's secular fabric. Now, in a diverse nation with multiple religious and cultural nar narratives already into existence, how does dharma actually serve as a unifying foundation in your view? So, the basic foundational ethos, the dharmic impulse, mm -hmm. is born from our Vedas mm -hmm. and our Puranas. And those are fundamentally very inclusive books. Right. If you read them, you get a sense of the larger uh, universalism mm -hmm. that undergirds their philosophy. 
and a sense of overarching uh, uh, oneness. So the oneness is not thrust upon anyone. There is no template. There are no books. There are no. There is no way of life that it prescribes. You can do whatever. In our dharmic culture, you have, you know, six different strands which compete and coexist. So you could be a Hindu, though you might be an atheist. Mm -hmm. You could be a Hindu, though you might be an agnostic. Mm -hmm. You might go to the mandir and you are still a Hindu, and you could be a disbeliever completely. So the point is that we have had the dharmic tradition has had a large number of philosophical strands and they have been allowed to subsist right. alongside each other mm -hmm. so if you just follow the precepts after all there are you know very many uh, slogans that are associated with our dharmic past and in the g20 for example we use one of those slogans vasudeva kutumbukam now what does that mean it means the world is one and there's one family. So if you are in any way in consonance with that philosophical tradition, there is no way that you could turn into what many people are saying, the ones that you're quoting, a sort of place where the minorities are kept out and right. so and so forth. But uh, in your and pledge for... Sorry, and very quickly, just to finish, no, f no policy of this government has been directed against any community any specific community, but I can list you several policies of so-called secular Congress administrations that have actually discriminated actively against sections of the populace. Right, you've actually broken it down in uh, all of the chapters. Yeah. Now, uh, well, the pledge for, for New Bharat, especially according to you in the book, has been inspired by Dharma. Now, some argue that it completely overlooks or downplays the reported uh, atrocities against minority communities. How do you address this criticism that your narrative might be selectively ignoring the issues that are majorly uh, affecting the marginalized groups in the nation? So, you know, India has been a secular, so-called secular country since 1947. Were there never any attacks on minorities? I come from a minority. Right. I'm a Kashmiri Hindu. And look at what happened to me. So this was according to, uh, you know, the, the left that makes this point is trying to conflate Hindutva with an exclusivist outlook. Actually, what is Hindutva? Tattva of Hinduness. The, unref the, the refined truths and the unalloyed universal belief in Dharma. That is all that it is. But to address your question, I haven't skirted anything. I have actually mentioned that there have been atrocities and it devolves upon the government of the day. See, you have to separate the philosophy from the administration. Hmm. As a custodian of law and order, hmm. the central government must step in, hmm. and wherever there is communal excess, it needs to take action. Right. That is a purely administrative action on its part. And obviously, if they fail to, then they must be held to account. On the other side is a philosophical approach. That philosophy itself is an inclusive one. I can't say that really about the left, that predominantly based on othering, using labels mm -hmm. to distinguish self from the other. There is no sense of self and the other in Sanatan Dharma. Right. It is a composite whole. So actually, if you adopt Sanatan Dharma and its beautiful precepts, there is no way you can even be the kind of republic that we have been all these 76, 77 years. Uh, like we are already touching down the topic of uh, atrocities against minority groups and you just mentioned that you are a Kashmiri Pandit. Now, how do you Hindu. react? Okay, Kashmiri Hindu to it's be very present. important because many people use the word Pandit to sort of not touch upon, to in some ways de-secularize or to secularize an atrocity. Actually, it was targeted against the Hindu community and we should be very open about saying it by using words like Pandit, etc. We dilute the fact that Hindus were expressly targeted. Right. We remove the word Hindu from the context. Okay. Yeah. So, as a Kashmiri Hindu, what were your personal views uh, on the revocation of Article 370 from Jammu and Kashmir? So, look, this matter is, as you know, sub judice, and on Monday the Supreme Court will pronounce its judgment. But we have written in our book that right. at, actually it was a uh, article that furthered the project of excluding rather than integrating Kashmir. It made 
Kashmir is a special case. A large number of central laws did not apply. Mm. And it actually birthed the spirit of separatism and continued it through. And in the constitution itself, as you know, it is said to be a temporary provision. So mm. it was supposed to be scrapped. Right. And over the years, there have been 50 plus attempts at diluting the import, many by the Congress party. So it was only remaining now in name, actually. It was not something that was actually on the books in the absoluteness uh, at which it was in 1947. It had been so diluted that, as I said, it was only in name. It had been hollowed out. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the controversies that have been surrounding you and your career. Your departure from Times Now earlier this year raised some eyebrows, right? Uh, did your exit impact the tone and direction of this book, especially considering the reputation and time and again in the past you've been accused of, uh, you know, towing the government's policies, lines, narratives. How have you been able to work? I think my work speaks for itself. I don't think that uh, on that account I need to be defensive at all. I think uh, when the cookie has crumbled, uh, I have questioned the government, for example, on some of the most salient things that have happened. Right. So I think, you know, I, I, I think this is labeling that happens quite conveniently from the other side. When they don't have an argument, they say, oh, you know, you're this media, you're that media. If you have an argument, come mm. make it. Right. Come make it. Because if a book is being written and you don't agree with its premise, write another book to argue against it. But the people who say this, mm are first and foremost the ones that have brought in A, the cancel culture, and B, diluted our freedom of expression. It was absolute independence. The first amendment that we made was to dilute it. And who made it? Jawaharlal Nehru. Right. So all these people who are the inheritors of this sort of great legacy of independence and all of that, what is their basic claim? Mm -hmm. You know, um, where does it come from? And where is it really that these people think that they can take the moral high ground? I, I'll tell you, under the Congress government, there was a day, just mm. one day, where mm. 6,000 sedition cases were filed. Right. And no one said a thing. It was supported by the media. Should we say that Godi media? There was a concept called kitchen cabinet mm. in Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time. And as you know, she desecrated the constitution. The kitchen cabinet was a bunch of journalists that supported Ms. Gandhi. Right. Can you imagine? Mm. The greatest atrocity on how her constitution was supported by journalists. Did anyone call them Godi media? Not really. This is so, quite fairly a so new term coin. So you have to coin. ask yourself. You have to yeah. ask yourself. One final word for the young viewers or the young journalists in the offing. Very, very important. If you are looking at journalism, remember, never move away from the hard fact. You can have a particular view, but never ever look away from the hard facts. They have to be the basis of every good argument you make. Right. Thank you so much, Rahul, for Thank speaking so to much. us. Well, for the viewers, uh, it's time for you to go and read the book. And till then, we'll keep coming back to you with more such intricate uh, conversations and debates only on CNN News 18. What do you feel about this book? Please leave a comment in the comment section below. And we'll keep coming back to you with more details. Till then, happy reading.